you uh, open your Bible to about, like, I don't know, 20 to 25 percent sent from the back, like 75 to 80 percent through, you'll find a page that looks something like this, I'm guessing. It says the, the New Testament. The New Testament is the story of everything that happened from the time that Jesus was conceived until his death and resurrection and ascension and what happened after that. And you, so you t- open it up and you turn from New Testament, that first page, you come to the Gospel of Matthew, then Mark, then Luke, then John. The Gospels are biographies uh, of Jesus' life. They tell the story of what he did while he was here on the planet. And those four stories all have some things that are in common and some things that are different in terms of where stories are placed and how they're told. And some biographies have stories that others don't. So there's some nuances in them. But they also have some some very strong similarities. And one of the similarities that you see in all four Gospels is that Jesus' adult ministry begins with being baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. A couple of the Gospels tell stories about Jesus' birth, Matthew and Luke, and and what happened with the whole um, Virgin Mary and the miraculous birth and Bethlehem and all those things. But they lead up to this point where Jesus begins his adult ministry, and it begins with Jesus being baptized. You fast forward to the end of Jesus' life after all of his travels, all of his teaching, all of his healings and restorations and miracles, all the things that he did through the course of his life. You come to his crucifixion, his resurrection, and now his ascension, Matthew chapter 28. Jesus has done his three years of ministry, his 33 years of life. He's getting ready to return to the Father. And he says to his disciples, he gives them these directions, these instructions. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always always to the very end of the age. Jesus' adult ministry, adult life, as is presented to us, begins with Jesus' baptism, and he's his last words, his parting instructions to his disciples are to go and proclaim the good news, make disciples, and baptize them. Baptism is the bookends of Jesus' life as an adult. If you turn now from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to the next book you find in the Bible, it's the book of Acts. Acts is actually shorthand for the Acts of the Apostles. It's what the apostles did in response to what Jesus had said and to what Jesus had taught them. It's what they did in response. And what you find in the book of Acts as you begin to read through Acts 1, Jesus kind of picking up a transition from, um, the, it's, he picks up with the ascension still, Jesus' last words to his disciples. And then his ascension He tells them to go and wait in Jerusalem. And after that, they go to Jerusalem. 40 days later, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the disciples, on the apostles at Pentecost. And from that day, you find this happening over and over and over again in the book of Acts. Pentecost. Peter, Peter proclaimed the good news, explained to them what was happening, why all this crazy stuff was happening when the Spirit was poured out on the church. And it says that as he taught, proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God, that there were those who accepted his message and they were baptized. And 3,000 were added to the number that day. That continues. Jesus, uh, Peter, and the disciples teaching. They're doing healings in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Chapter 8, the church begins to be persecuted and spread out, running for their lives in many cases. And one of the apostles, one of the disciples, Philip, went down into Samaria. Now we've moved from the 
epicenter of the Jewish faith, Jerusalem, out into the outer skirts. Remember in Jesus' ministry that the Samaritans were, um, they were ne'er-do-wells. You didn't associate, the Jews didn't associate with Samaritans. But Philip is now going down into Samaria and proclaiming the good news. And the people, it says in Acts chapter 8, when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And then the, in, as you read on through Philip's chapter, or in uh, Acts chapter 8, Philip is instructed by the Spirit to take a journey down to um, the road that goes to Gaza from Samaria. And he's um, walking down the road, and the Spirit tells him to, there's a guy riding in a chariot, uh, uh, Ethiopian eunuch, and the Spirit says, go up and talk to the guy. And so Philip runs, or, um, yeah, Philip runs up and runs alongside the guy, and he re- discovers that the guy is reading the book of Isaiah. And he says, what are you reading? It's like, Isaiah, do you know what you're saying? No, how can I understand unless somebody explains it to me? So Philip, it's really a weird story. Philip hops up on the the chariot, and they continue their way down the road. And as they're driving along, Philip's explaining the good news of the kingdom of God, beginning from Isaiah and and going forward. And they come to a a pool of water, and the, the Ethiopian eunuch says, is there any reason that I shouldn't be baptized? Philip says no, and he get out. He believed, and he was baptized. Next chapter, Paul, Saul, who was the persecutor of the Christians, he's the reason they're all spreading out to these um, vast regions, has his own direct encounter. He gets to hear the proclamation of the good news from Jesus' own mouth in a divine intervention. Jesus knocks him off his high, high horse with a blinding light and explains what's going on. And then the next day, Peter encounters a man who comes to him and explains the gospel. And it says that he got up, Paul got up, and was baptized. Acts chapter 10. Peter has a divine encounter in which he's instructed to go to Cornelius' house. Cornelius is just like a full-on Gentile. The Jews and the Gentiles, like they did not converse with each other. The gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, as the apostles understood it to this point, was for the Jewish people. Jesus had given them, given them indications that it was bigger than that. If they knew their Old Testament and read it better, they would have known that it's bigger than that. But they didn't get it yet. And so Peter has this encounter. I don't have time to tell the whole story. But the, Peter, the, the encounter says, go to Cornelius' house. Go to this Gentile's house. And he goes there. And the Gentile had been told to send for Peter. And he gets there. And he goes in the house. He says, I love this story. He says, you know what? I'm really not supposed to be talking to you. I'm not supposed to be hanging out with you because you are Gentiles and I am a Jew. But here I am because God told me. He proclaims the good news of the kingdom of God. They received the Holy Spirit. And after they received the Spirit, there's like, okay, well, what are we going to do now? Well, they believed the good news. They received the Spirit. I think we should baptize them. And they did. Saul becomes Paul, begins his ministry, and he goes throughout the Roman Empire, or um, and continues to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And in the city of Philippi, he's preaching by a stream. Some women are listening to him. Lydia hears Paul's teaching. And the Lord, it says, opened Lydia's heart to respond to Paul's message. And she and the members of her household were baptized. Paul and his friend Silas create a ruckus. They end up in jail. They're in jail. They're having a little midnight worship service, singing hymns and praying. And and then there's a violent earthquake, and the doors fly open, and they're free to leave. And the Philippian jailer, who, if his prisoners escape, is going to lose his life, so he decides to take his life before they kill him. And Paul says, no, we're all here. And the Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They treated their wounds from the, um, from the earthquake. And it says, then immediately he and all his household were baptized. 
Acts chapter 18, Paul is again teaching and preaching in the synagogues. He gets thrown out. He goes to Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard the gospel that Paul preached believed and were baptized. So I think you probably see a, a pattern here, right? The good news was proclaimed. Some people believed it. Some people didn't. The people who didn't believe it, they didn't get baptized. They beat Paul and his friends. But the people who believed it were baptized. Sacraments are holy signs and seals that are visible displays of spiritual realities. The Heidelberg Catechism says they were instituted by God so that by our use of them, he might make us understand more clearly the promise of the gospel and might put his seal on that promise. The sacraments were gifts given to us that appeal to the senses. Sight. We get to see something happening. Taste. Smell. That they are signs illustrating what has happened through Christ's ministry and seals confirming that it did happen. We, in our tradition, celebrate two sacraments. Last week we talked about the Lord's Supper. And we celebrated the Lord's Supper together. Signs and seals of Jesus' body broken, his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Nourishing our souls, pointing us forward to his glorious return in the great banquet. Signs and seals of what Jesus had done. This week, we're unpacking baptism. Last week, the message was, do this, because Jesus said, do it. This week's message is, do this too, because Jesus said, do this too. What does baptism signify and seal? Going back to Pentecost, Peter's message, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. That baptism is a physical sign. It's a physical bath, if you will, that signals for us and seals for us the spiritual cleansing that Jesus makes available. Paul would later say, get up and be baptized and wash your sins away. Wash your sins away, calling on his name. Now, lots of people get in water and get clean from the water that don't have their sins washed away, right? It's not the water that washes the sins away. But just as when we take a bath and we are clean, what Jesus has accomplished for us is that through his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins that we are made clean and baptism points us to that reality. Signifies our cleansing. It signifies our union with Christ. Paul says we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. That we through baptism, it's signing and signifying that we are united with Christ. If I take this picture, it's a great picture. You might want to check it out before you leave. And just say, this is you, right? And you put the picture in the book. Now, whatever happens with the book at this point in time happens to the picture, right? If I set the picture down, you're set down. I pick it up, you're set up. If I dip it in the water and pull it out of the water, you've been in the water, you've been pulled out of the water. Whatever happens to the, the picture, because it's in the book, happens to the picture. If the picture is you, it's happened to you. That we, through Christ's sacrifice, are united with Christ. That when Christ died, 
and we are in Christ, that we died with him to our sin. Paul says, when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. That when we baptize, that we're going down into the water, signifying that we were in Christ in his sacrifice for us. And in the same way, that when he comes up out, when he come up out of the water, Jesus came up out of the grave and was raised to new life. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Died with Christ to sin. Raised with Christ to new life. clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Paul says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. And for all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Here's the deal, right? Jesus died. He was sinless. But he took the sin of the world upon his shoulders so that the whole world who would believe in him was cleansed by his sacrifice. He took our sin upon him and he was raised to new life so that now we have his righteousness. He took our sin, we're clothed in his righteousness. When God looks at someone who is in Jesus, he does not see your broken, shady, shameful past. He doesn't see the things that you've done. He doesn't see the things that he sees you in Christ, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Signifies our union, our oneness, our integration into Christ and our belonging then to the body of Christ. We are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. One body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. That everyone who has received Christ is baptized into a single integrated unit that is the body of Christ. And through our union with Christ, we are made one with each other. That united body is what we call the church. It, it, it is God's people gathered together, united by the Spirit. So anyone who ever says to you, well, I have a relationship with God, but I don't really belong to the church. I don't care about the church. I don't want to be a part of the church. Now, they might be talking about like this physical building that we go to on a Sunday morning. We come together and we worship. This is, this is church. And maybe they don't go to a building and you can still be a follower of Jesus. But you cannot be a follower of Jesus and not be a part of, integrated into this body that is the living, breathing presence of God in the world today. And it is by design that we're brought together, Paul says, with all these different gifts that we bring to the table that help each other grow, that sharpen us, that make us more and more like Jesus. And you say, but the church is so full of, you know, broken people and, and so many terrible things happen in the church. And I was like, yeah, I know. It's because it's made up of a bunch of broken, sinful people. But we're designed to come together. And, and what is Jesus' gospel? What is his message? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Which neighbors? Family, friends, Samaritans, Gentiles, Republicans, Democrats, enemies. Where do you learn to love? with the people that love you back and make you feel really good about yourself all the time? Everybody loves those people. 
We learn to love. As we rub shoulders against people who don't look and smell like us, who don't act like us, who don't think like us. That baptism is a sign of our belonging to Christ and a sign of our belonging to the body of Christ. I have, um, I got this when I was um, in the beginning of my ministry. It's, it's a seal. It's like if you go to like an official government document and they seal it, it says like this was, you know, done here. I, I bought this because I have a lot of books and I would loan my books out and I wouldn't get them back. Um, so I thought, well, if I put a seal in my book, then people will know that it's my book. It's my seal. It says it belongs to me. And um, it didn't actually work. I still don't get my books back. <laughs> um, but I do hope that one day when they open the book, they will open it up and see, oh, that's Tim's book, and at least feel guilty about it, right? <laughs> it says, it belongs to me. Baptism is a sign. This person, God says, this person belongs to me, belongs to my family, belongs together. It's his seal. Who then should be baptized? Those who hear the good news of the kingdom of God and who believe it. Paul says, confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that Jesus is alive, living among us now, living in us, and you will be saved. And all who are saved, all who believe, are baptized. The essence of the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, is not something we do for God, but wholly on understanding and embracing what God has done for us. It's about what God has done for us. It's about receiving what God has done on our behalf. Now, I open talking about... um, the New Testament. If you go back to the very beginning of your Bible, you find another page that looks like this. It's called the Old Testament. And if you read on through there, the Old Testament is about everything that happened prior to Jesus coming to the earth. And the Old Testament, many people look at as being something completely disconnected from and other than the New Testament. I hear people say often, you know, that we talk about the, 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 the distinguish between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament as if there's some point in time when God became a different entity or different being. Jesus didn't see it that way. He says, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. That's the Old Testament. I didn't come to do away with what was in the old part of the book. I didn't come because God changed his mind about things. This was God's plan all along through the whole story. And what you find in the Old Testament is God is a promise-making God and a promise-keeping God. We call them covenants. And, and God in the Old Testament made a lot of covenant, covenants. And all the things that he promised in the Old Testament, Jesus said, I will fulfill. I came to accomplish their purpose. For example, after the flood, you remember the story of Noah. He comes out of the ark. And God makes a covenant with Noah. He says, I will never destroy the earth again by a flood. And he says this. He says, I am now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And then he calls Abraham, says to Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to give you a land. You're going to have a history. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth through you, which is kind of foreshadowing the whole Gentile thing. 
Jews, I'm going to bless you, but I'm using you to bless the rest of creation. Jesus was the fulfillment of that. His promise to Abraham, I will establish my covenant with you as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come. And then to Abraham's son Isaac, he says, to you and your descendants, I will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. And to Isaac's son Jacob, Abraham's grandson, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land which you are living, in which you are lying. And then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants became a great nation that's now in bondage in Egypt. And he sends Moses to deliver them from bondage in Egypt. And Moses says, know that the Lord your God is God. He is faithful, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. A thousand generations. And to David, he says in a promise that he made, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. He says to David, your throne will be established forever. He makes promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Moses, to Jacob, to Moses, to David. But he doesn't just make a promise to them. He says to you and what? And your descendants and your offspring and the next generation. And from Abraham forward. The sign of that covenant, like the seal that God gave them to say, this is, you belong to me, was circumcision. And it was put on the father and the sons. The promise to you and your descendants. In Christ, Paul says, in Christ now, you were circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Like we're not talking about the surgical procedure anymore. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. It's a spiritual transaction now. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And Peter says then, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. In our church, and not every church does this, not every denomination sees this the same way, not everyone understands this the same way. Some churches believe very strongly that you must believe before you are baptized. We understand baptism is a sign and a seal of God's covenant promise, and throughout history, over and over and over again, the seal was placed on the believer and their offspring. All that to say, in our church, we also baptize infants children who don't yet believe and they are not saved by their baptism. It's as some people believe in in the Catholic Church, baptismal regeneration, regeneration, that you are saved through the act of baptism. Baptism is a sign and a seal, not a means of salvation. But it's claiming God's promise on behalf of ourselves and on our children. And you see, as we read through those passages, that in Lydia's household, and in Philipp, um, in the jail, Philippian jailer's household, that Lydia believed, that the Philippian jailer believed, and their whole household was baptized. We're not doing any um, children or infant baptisms today, but I just want to put that out there, because if you have children... Um, and you want to have them baptized, then we embrace that thoroughly and we'll have a conversation with you. Um, please let me know and we will arrange a time for, um, for, for doing infant and children's baptisms. But for today, we are doing adult baptisms and it is going to um, 
be a continuation of our service. I'm sorry to our online viewers that you won't be able to be a part of this. Um, but uh, we're going to leave from here. We're going to go over to my house, which is um, four blocks over Ashworth and turn left and four houses on the right on Lorelei. Catch me at the door and I'll give it and you can enter it into your phone and it'll take you right there. Or you can follow me. I'm going to walk home and you can just walk down the street with me. That'll be cool. But we have some folks who, um, who want to be baptized, who have heard the gospel, have believed it and received it, and are claiming God's promise on their behalf today. So uh, we're going to conclude our service in that way. If you came today and you were not planning on being baptized, but you have not been baptized and you have believed and you have received and you wish to be baptized, um, we will arrange for that to happen today. Because um, everybody in the house, you live close enough that you could run home and prepare yourself and get back in time for us to do that. Okay? So if you want to be baptized today and all of those things are true, confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Then come and we will baptize you today and celebrate with you as a part of God's family. Amen? Lord, thank you. <laughs> thank you that you are a God who knows us and knows us our weaknesses. That it's hard for us to believe things that we cannot see. And accommodating that by giving us things that we can't see that remind us of the things that we can't see. That confirm for us that those spiritual realities are real and true and have happened through these physical signs as indicators. I pray that as we celebrate baptisms today, God, that we would rejoice with you in all of heaven and those who have been lost and are found. have been alone and now know that they belong. Who might have feeling, felt forsaken but know now that you have been with them all along and they will never leave them or forsake them. Pray for the church or to be the church, the body of Christ in the world, and to continue to do what Jesus said to his disciples in proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and continuing to walk and live in love together in the power of your presence as one in your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name.